So it's late February and that means it's time for the dinghy show. And here we are. It's one of my favourite shows. It has one of the best atmospheres. No, I'll rephrase that. It has the best atmosphere you can find at any boat show in the world. Honestly, it does. Anyway, we're here. But we're here with a big difference this year because this year we're not in Alexandra Palace. We're in Farnborough. The whole show has actually moved up here now. And what a show it is. When you come in through the door, you, rather than it being in a number of different halls as it used to be in Alexandra Palace, it's all in one giant great big exhibition hall. And it's fantastic, it really is, because you see just how big and how vibrant the dinghy scene is. I love it. Now, one of the classes that we've covered quite a lot on Planet Sail is the International Foiling Moth. An incredible class, it seems to be constantly expanding. But even I hadn't realised quite how different the modern generation are. Look at this one, it's called an MD3. And the thing that really strikes me about this boat is that everything is about the aero. Look at how smooth it is. Look at these rounded sections here. Everything smooth right the way around the wings here which are now completely integral all the control lines run under the deck so this is the these are the only bits of line that are actually exposed and in the air the whole thing is all about reducing the aerodynamic drag this comes from sort of a windsurfer kind of idea isn't it it's got this sort of package around here to clean up the airflow around this area and the whole thing extends right the way back even when we get back to the rudder stock here it's all got a carbon fairing all in here everything's been smoothed off to reduce the drag it's incredible but if you really want to know the detail about it you're going to talk to this man adam may <laughs> adam you i mean you spent ages in moths yeah. you, over the years tell me about this boat did i get it right was it is it about error it's all about aero now, yeah. It, um, I was lucky enough to be involved in the development of this real early on. Um, a friend of mine, Gonzalo Redondo, did uh, aero studies on it. He did. He ran the CFD department for American Magic. So actually, when you zoom out, you actually notice a lot of the sort of aero tricks from the AC75. So actually, if you look closely, this now features a skeg underneath. Oh, really? That um, it was an interesting study. Even though the boat, we're not seeing it close to the water like the 75s were we still get to effectively improve the efficiency of the rig a little bit by doing it. So there's an interesting trade-off. Do you go for just minimum drag or do you actually, this actually improves the driving force a little bit. So it's been fun playing with, with a number. And is that why we saw it? Because I remember looking on Luna Rossa, it was, well, it wasn't quite this time last year, but when Luna Rossa came out for the Challenger series, they had a skeg, but it was a very short little skeg that ran. That's what they were trying to do as well, is it? Yeah, well, they were playing, it's partly the aero, but they were also doing more of the ceiling, but there's definitely an efficiency gain of the whole rig. It's an interesting one, because a moth is historically a really low aspect ratio rig. I mean, I sail an ACAT as well, and then, you know, it's a lovely, elegant, high aspect ratio rig, and the moth has always been limited. But as we've gone lower and lower, these deck sweepers, you know, sort of the efficiency of that is almost worse, but we've gained the efficiency by sealing the deck, and now the hull is acting as part of that sail. So it's how do you combine the two together to improve the whole efficiency and so now it's all about cleaning up the airflow you know all the old wing bars of the past have gone everything's hidden below deck it's all just making it work as a package so it's really about blending the sail and the hull together and that's where now the skeg is starting to form a bit of that sort of development and so what are, what are the kind of gains that we're seeing now as a result of this compared to i don't know a generation of five years ago or something like that uh, well, they were a different boat from then. I mean, I'm only just getting back into the class. I've been busy with a cup and other and Olympic stuff, so I'm about to find that out for myself. But the speeds that these guys are doing now, it's, the moth class has been incredible. I remember when it was a big deal if you made the 20 knot club. Really? And now that's an upwind speed. Really? Is that right? And so what <laughs> oh, are they yeah. doing downwind now? Oh, these guys are casually going really close to 30s and probably just over, but just, just shy of 30 is a pretty classical yeah. speed now, and upwind speeds... I mean, it depends on the loading, but you know, they're all happily talk about 18 knots up wind, really? which is have, what we were and doing downwind. And do you think they've peaked now? It's probably in an interesting refinement stage now. 
but there's always gains in the foils. You know, the, the control system is always gains in that. So control system, foil refinement, the aero gains and matching the, the, the sail to the hull sort of package. I'm sure there's still gains to right. come. It's, it always amazes me how much quicker they continue to get. And talking of numbers getting bigger, the price hasn't got any cheaper either, has it? I mean, what do they cost now? And this is quite expensive. Over well, now I, 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 I haven't officially heard, but these these are being made in Poland and then Ovington are sort of fitting out and finishing them. But I think this is in the 25,000 plus rig region. So the price is coming back down again. There right. was a silly period and I think it's, it's coming back down again. Luckily, we're on the other side of that. Fascinating. All I need to do is to lose three stone, maybe four stone, and I'll be, I'll be on one. No, it likes a bit of writing moment, you'll be fine. <laughs> it's always good to speak to an expert. Thanks very much, Adam. Cheers. Good Cheers. to see you. You too. One of the great things about the dinghy show is you get to see quite a lot of boats that you don't normally see out on the circuit. And one of those that I get drawn to pretty much every time I come to this show is the International Canoe. It's an extraordinary boat and it sort of in many ways goes against, you could say, the trend that we see with sort of skiff type boats and foiling boats and the rest of it. But it's certainly no less extreme. This is a single hander that has a main and a jib, the jib self tacking. But of course the big characteristic of the international canoe is the sliding seat here. And I've never sailed a sliding seat boat. I'd like to have a go. I'm not sure how long I'd last, but it does look a lot of fun. Quite a narrow boat, quite a high performance boat, very long as well. But what I discovered today that I didn't know was just how light these boats are. The International Canoe, apparently the minimum class weight is 50 kilos, five zero kilos for a boat this size. If that doesn't mean much to you, consider this. The Laser is 90 kilos. The Laser 1, or the Ilka as it's known now, 90 kilos and an aero is 45 kilos. You get a hell of a lot of boat with an international canoe for 50 kilos. Now for any dinghy show, one of the classes that you have to come and see is the Merlin Rockets because they are just works of art. But look how far they've come. This is one of the, well, maybe not original. When was this built? 1964, but it's still quite old. This is where they've come to. Canterbury Tales 2022. This is the state of the art at the moment. They're absolutely gorgeous. They are a bit of a string fest when you look inside them, but they are absolute works of art. But to talk us through it, we've got Mark Barwell here, who knows a lot more about it. Mark, nice Hello. to meet you. Now, you were telling me a little bit earlier on about the way that the class is sort of structured, because we've got these two extremes that we've just seen here. Yep. The boat from 1964, yep. the boat from 2022. And these are probably quite expensive machines nowadays and maybe a little bit off-putting, but tell me what you were telling me earlier on about how the class is structured. So this year we bought three boats, three distinct designs and types of boats and three different generations. Um, when you look at the class, a lot of people see it split possibly between two divisions. You see the modern, ultra-new, uh, carbon fibre, up-to-speed generation. We've also got the narrower you know, 1960s generation, which are very popular on the river, where it's successful, fast on the river. Uh, in actual fact, the narrower boat will still beat the wider boat in a lot of river sailing situations. Mm -hmm. But there was a huge amount of Merlin rockets built in the 80s, 90s, which are what we would call classic. We've got a modern, we've got the vintage, we've now got this new classic class. And the idea being that a large volume of boats were built, we want to give them a competitive circuit as well. So now we're going to recognise the classic uh, age range. They're going to still sell the Silver Tiller, still do the Demay River Series if they want to, but they'll get a separate set of results, which allows people to find some Merlin rockets which are a better entry level cost, resurrect them if they need resurrecting, and then competitively sail within their own sector, their own group. Right. So and you've got one here, haven't you? Can we have a look at yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely we can. Let's have a look at that. So, so here we've got this a 1989 built boat. When it was first launched, it was very, very successful. Um, wooden built. Uh, it was a Canterbury Tales design built by John Turner. John Turner's quite a famous boat builder and designer in his own right. Um, but this is the Canterbury Tales, uh, was one of several designed to built around that era, but the Canterbury Tales has become quite a benchmark boat, so much so that the modern boat that we saw at the other end is also a Canterbury Tales. So 
a moulding was taken off of this design and a brand new Merlin now is something that is very, very close to something that was designed, you know, late 80s, built late 80s. So they're not hugely different when you look at them. You can get these for a fraction of the cost. I was going to ask you about that. Race. So what kind, of, yeah, what kind of price could you pick up? I would have said that like if this? you, I mean, if it's had some work done on it, you know, this one's obviously been a little bit refinished. Um, you're three to five thousand pounds you would find yourself a you know a, an entry level boat of this generation may need some work maybe in good order um, but but it's you know it's relatively competitive money it's not going to depreciate massively it's done that depreciation over the last you know 30 40 years so you what know what about a new uh, boat new ones with all the bells and whistles on it when it's all done you're into the early 20s around that kind of money but that's if you tick every box and ask for every extra that you want and that's traders and covers and everything else that goes with it you can buy a bare hull from uh, from window boats and you can fit it out yourself and a bare hull is you know six or seven about six or seven thousand pounds i believe and you can do all the fit out yourself if you want to yeah. so there's ways to get into the fleet do a bit of the work yourself and keep the cost down if you want to yeah. uh, but likewise you can tick every box and uh, get something out of the packet fast straight away if you want to. <laughs> now one of the great pleasures of any show, but particularly the dinghy show, is the number of people that you bump into along the way. And I've just bumped into my very good friend here, Freddie, who I'm sure you've all seen on Planet Sail plenty of times before. Freddie Carr, great to see you. And you? It's a good pad, isn't it? This is all yeah. right. I love the new venue. I must say it works really well as a, as a venue and I've got my full anorak on today and I'm, I'm geeking out on dinghies. It's, it's a cool day. It's amazing to see the whole dinghy scene all in one yeah. room, isn't it? It yeah. makes you realise just how big the dinghy scene actually is. It makes you realise how healthy the racing in the UK is and the amount of sailing clubs here, the amount of different classes that are here is really encouraging and the amount of enthusiasm around British sailing and I'm sure a lot of it's got to do with the, the Olympics last year. The amount of kids here is, is wicked and they're all buzzing for boats that I could only dream of when I was their age, so they're very lucky. Yeah. Now, you talked about geeking in full anorak yeah. mode. What have you seen? Well, I'm, yeah, I've just turned 40, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be sailing a foiling dinghy anytime soon. Um, but yeah, I must say this OK dinghy um, made by Ovington has really caught my eye. I mean, I'm sort of mid-90 kilos at the moment, and uh, seeing, the, seeing the OK Nationals in Weymouth last year, a, a windy event, and following my good mate Jim Turner, battle it out there um, and the OK has been on my radar for a while and it just feels after sort of 20 years of yacht racing in the cup it's time to get back to my grassroots a bit and go and do some good racing on the south coast bit at Hailing Island or Stokes Bay so I'm just casing it out let's say. It's interesting to hear you say about the OK because I thought you'd say a fin I mean you're you're well, you're certainly tall enough for yeah, the fin. Yeah, yeah. Well, my worry with the fin is Giles Scott would pro probably try and sell me some <laughs> of his old kit for an extortionate price. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the fin I've looked at as well. But, uh, yeah, I'm around the south coast, there's obviously a good fleet at Menjum in the fin, but there's a building OK fleet at yeah. Hailing Island and there's a few out of Emsworth, my local club, and I've just always quite liked the look of it. And it would encourage me to lose a bit more weight if I had to get down uh, okay. to, to OK weight rather than be a, a bigger fin sailor. Well, this is going to sound very, very contrived, but I promise you it's true because Roger, who's filming us here, who came in, he will bear witness to this. Right. The first boat we stopped at when we came in, yeah. and I said, I really still fancy one of these. Yeah. Was he OK? Yeah. Now, my, my father had an OK, and right. so I'm very fond of it because yeah. I sailed it as a kid. Right. But it is interesting, isn't it, to see this. This is an old design, yeah. isn't it? And yet yeah. it's going through this resurgence. Yeah, I what, do you think, what do you think is driving that? Do you know, I don't know. I, I think there's obviously so many boats on the market around this, let's call it, I look at things in terms of sort of crew weight. And I guess the, the mid-70s to mid-90s, there's a broad spectrum of boats. I think it's tweaky enough that you can have a bit of fun with it and be a bit geeky in terms of the sail shape and the mast, the, the mast setup. But it doesn't seem like a class where it's an out of control arms race. Now, with the fin not being an Olympic class anymore, maybe that will settle down. But don't get me wrong, the, the speed games you can make in the fin by chucking a lot of money at it, I'm sure are still there. Whereas this, I think, is just the next step down. And uh, I just I just love the simplicity of the deck layout and uh, I grew up sailing lasers and it, it feels a bit of a tweaky step on from a laser, yeah. which isn't well, hard, to be honest. Well, no, <laughs> but it also it's pretty comfortable, isn't it? That's what yeah, appeared to me. Yeah. I mean, I'm a little bit ahead of you on the age and I, I am sailing a laser at the moment. Are you? 
and it's an instrument of torture, frankly, yeah, it imagine. really is. And yeah. I looked at this and thought, oh, look at that squidgy side yeah. deck, somewhere to put my feet. Yeah, Lovely. yeah exactly. <laughs> well, there we go. Well, I think we're both going to have to get one then. Then we can go out and do a little bit of two boat testing. Yeah. The only thing that puts me off is when you say you're going to need to lose a little bit more to get into this. You've already just told me how much you've lost <laughs> yeah, I've, recently. I've I'm, a I'm a long way behind you on that front. But anyway, I'll just go for the writing moment. Uh, what very, the hell? Yeah, why not? Just h don't hike as hard. Yeah. Well, I never do. <laughs> Good to see you, Freddie. You, mate. Cheers. One of the first features we ran on Planet Sail was actually a report from the Dusseldorf Boat Show back in 2019. Yes, I know you remember that well. And one of the boats that was there was an electric rib, and it was produced by RS, who are better known for their sailing boats. Well, here at the dinghy show, a few years later, the game's moved on a bit, and I'm here with Alex, the joint CEO of RS. Alex, it's now called the Pulse 63, it's blue, it looks very different. Tell me about what's happened since we last saw the boat. Well, yeah, I mean, there's certainly, it's evolved, uh, definitely. I mean, after the launch in 19, I mean, that was always a, a pre-production prototype boat that we had at the show, and it was more of a case of trying to hear customers, seeing what people wanted, and bits and pieces, and then obviously over some development time, there were things that we wanted to kind of do. And so this here is our first production kind of coach boat so at the moment we've got three uh, basic boats one coach one commercial one leisure boat and within all of those there's then you can spec it up and spec it down depending on what you want to do um, but as you say here this is our coach boat um, I think one of the biggest changes from the pulse that you saw on the show was um, the battery area so now what we've got down is we've increased that size um, just mainly um, to allow us more flexibility in time but also it allows us the whole idea of what we're trying to do here is a blank canvas so you can if you want to move the console aft or forward you can and the deck allows you to go and do that we also wanted to move the batteries around from a weight dis dis distribution at the same time to make that go and work as well so so now the battery box is the length of the boat so we can then want to move them back and forth depending on on um, the spec that you want just give us a quick idea of the kind of performance we're talking about I mean, as in so the duration the speeds and the duration that you get from an electric boat the whole idea with the coach boat here when we've done some analysis generally speaking coaches are normally doing anything between 10 and 15 uh, not over the day for sure there's some kind of there's some peaks um, so this would last all day um, now one thing which has in my view been a game changer since we last met is we've changed from a hundred to 400 volts and by doing that that's enabled us to look at some just some new tech so at the moment we can rapid charge the whole boat uh, from naught to 100 percent in one hour 40 but what that also does it allows you to potentially have less batteries less weight less cost because you can be charging up a lot quicker so since Dusseldorf there's been a whole heap of changes certainly from kind of that side of things how many boats do you expect to be building a year? How quickly is this going to sort of get out of okay, the so market? Okay, so we are um, so we are planning to do 50 boats for this year, and we've already sold over half of those. Oh, so, really? so from from that point of view, it's super exciting. How does so, it? What does it cost, and how does it compare to a conventional rib of a sort of similar okay, size? So, this is the kind of coach boat. So, this is at 74,000 pounds. So, it is significantly more than. Um, a coach boat of the same type but obviously there are some big cost savings obviously with your fuel no servicing and all of those sorts of things and obviously a whole heap cleaner for the environment too well i wish you well i mean it's a fascinating project i thought it was really interesting when we saw it you know back in 2019 and it's great to see that uh, it's evolved and it's now a production version. So good luck with it. Thank you. Well, you have to, to come out at some point. I tell you what, it would make. It's just in exactly the right colour for a planet a planet sail logo. Well, there we enough. go. We can definitely do that. <laughs> anyway, good to see you. Yeah, you too. All right, Thanks, take Alex. care. Cheers.
Now, it's clear that at this show there is an awful lot to buy. Most of it is brand new and has got a price tag to match. But one of the things that I really like about this show is it's not necessarily all about buying new boats. And this is a great example of it. This is the 4000. Now, you might recognize this as being the old Laser 4000 because that's what it was, the smaller sister to the Laser 5000, the twin trapeze boat that was actually designed for the Olympics but didn't actually make it there. Anyway, this is the 4000 and it hasn't been in build for quite some time and yet it's going through a resurgence. It has been actually for the last few years. A lot of holes were built and then sort of abandoned really, lost to dinghy parks and the rest of it. And the class association sort of got together and encouraged people to buy a hull, do it up, put a new rig in. They've modified it a bit so it's got a slightly different mainsail, slightly different sail plan. But actually it's really quite an affordable way of getting on the water. It's a really interesting boat. Let's have a look at the boat first. So it's a, it's a skiff type um, configuration, retractable canteen bowsprit, fractional uh, asymmetric kite, spinnaker chute, single trapeze with uh, adjustable racks so you can adjust the racks depending on your height and your weight but only one trapeze unlike things like the 800 and uh, other twin trapeze boats and a conventional sitting out position. So it's a, a great boat. I sold one of these when they were pretty new. I can't remember when it was but when they were new I remember sailing one of these and being very taken by it. But the really key thing about it is that talking to some of the people here who are exhibiting this boat, you can pick a hull up for something like three, four, five hundred pounds. Some people have picked them up for. Yes, you've got to spend probably around 1,800 quid for a brand new suit of sails. But if it's got a rig, all the better. In some ways, I wish I hadn't seen it.